Good morning and welcome to Bitterkey Baptist Church's Sunday morning service. It's great to have you with us. My name's Tom, I'm part of the ministry team here at the church and I know I say this every week but we get new people all the time and so it's great to have you with us whether you're a regular member of our church or whether you're someone who's stumbled across us for the first time. Welcome and it's great to have you joining us for worship this morning. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the uh, passage that we're going to be looking at today and then we're going to hear it read to us and explore what God is saying to us through it today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you, Lord, that wherever we are watching this, you are there with us. And Father, we give thanks that as we study your word this morning, as we've sung songs of worship to you, you hear every word, you speak to us through the Bible, you speak to us through that book that is your word that you've given for us. And as we, as we allow ourselves to listen to you this morning, Father, I pray that each and every one of us will receive a word from you, will receive a, a warmth, an encouraging feeling inside us, a, a, a reassurance that you are with us through your spirit. Father, I pray that the message of your scripture will ring loud in our ears today, not just, not just as something pleasant to listen to, but as something that has an impact on us this week as we seek to live out your word to us. So Lord, bless us, be with us and speak to us, we pray this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, once again, it's great to have you with us and... If you are new to these services, then you won't have heard one of these sermons before. But if you're not, if you've listened to some of these services over the past few months, then you will know that quite often in, in, my, in my preaching, I like to use personal experience, personal stories, things from, from childhood or adult life which have happened to me. Um, because I believe very much that faith is something that is relevant, that, is, that has a place in our everyday life, in the world around us. It's not simply a bunch of stories from many, many years ago. And so I think that we should all be looking for parallels in our own lives that we can draw with the scriptures that we read. Sometimes the stories that I use are, are funny, they make people laugh. Other times they're quite poignant, they can, they can serve to, to illustrate a point or maybe show the relevance of scripture in today's world. Like most families, my family have an abundance of stories and experiences, which when we're sitting around a dinner table or, or at a family event and someone says, do you remember when the whole family suddenly are united in their recollection? And all of us can either become very somber or we can burst into laughter or we can look back with thankful hearts for the experience we went through. But you see, the recollection unites us, it brings us together as one, and every family has those sorts of stories, the sorts of stories that only the family remember and share. This morning, we're going to look at a passage of scripture which records an account of an experience that Jesus' family would have looked back on in years to come and said, do you remember when? It's one of the very, very few insights we get into Jesus' family life. It's the only insight we get into his adolescence. And in this passage, we also have the first recorded words of Jesus. So it's a passage that we can often gloss over. It's a passage that we can sometimes um, think that we know and therefore not spend too much time dwelling on. But this morning, we're going to dwell on it and we're going to begin by listening to it being read right now. So if you've got a Bible, please turn to Luke chapter 2 and read along with us. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the festival according to the custom. After the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they travelled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, 
listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me? he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. One of the things I love about Luke's Gospel is the fact that Luke focuses on the humanity of Jesus. He focuses on showing that Jesus was just like you and I, a regular person. He was fully man. Luke goes to great pains to demonstrate this and he includes many different stories of Jesus which the other Gospels don't record. In the same way, um, Matthew, when he wrote his gospel, he was writing for a predominantly Jewish readership. He wanted to point back to the, the traditions and the, the prophecies of the Jewish faith to demonstrate that Jesus was the Messiah that had been promised for so long. Mark was writing his gospel for a predominantly Gentile, non-Jewish readership. And so he went to great lengths to demonstrate the fact that, that Jesus was the Son of God, not just come to save the Jews, but instead to save all people. John's Gospel was written to be very theological. John really drills down into the theology of Jesus, demonstrating how Jesus um, revealed so much of the nature of God through himself. And therefore, John concludes that Jesus was the Son of God. And Luke goes to great lengths to demonstrate that despite being the Son of God, Jesus was also fully man. So the four Gospels all have their, their different approaches, their different agendas, if you like. And indeed, they all also acknowledge that they only scratch the surface. There was so much more in Jesus' life that wasn't recorded. This passage that we've just read only occurs in Luke's Gospel. And it's the only time that we get a glimpse of the adolescent Jesus. I don't know about you, but I have probably a very fixed image of Jesus. If I hear the name Jesus in December, I think of a little baby in a manger. I think of stars and shepherds and wise men and Bethlehem and all the rest of it, because that's Christmas Jesus. For the rest of the year, Jesus is probably about 30 in my mind, and he's doing things. He's, he's achieving things, he's, he's healing, he's performing miracles, he's, he's teaching people. And then around Easter time, of course, Jesus is on the cross, paying the price for my sin. And shortly afterwards, Jesus is, is dressed in white, coming out of the tomb and eventually ascending into heaven. At no point in my year is Jesus a spotty adolescent. That's not the Jesus that I think of. And yet, there is a huge chunk of Jesus's life, the majority of Jesus's life, that we know nothing about. So in this passage here, Luke gives us adolescent Jesus. He's 12 years old. To begin with, Luke tells us of a family tradition. He says, every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of Passover. Now there were three main Jewish festivals which people were encouraged or maybe even expected to go to Jerusalem for. There was the Feast of Tabernacles, there was the Feast of the Harvest, which we spoke about briefly in a Pentecost service a couple of weeks ago, and then there was the Feast of the Passover. Realistically, most families had a long, long journey to get to Jerusalem, and to do it three times a year simply wasn't practical. So Passover became the, the focal point, the main Jewish festival. And that's why Luke tells us that every year, this wasn't just a one-off, every single year they went to Jerusalem. When I was a child, we would often go to the same place on holiday several years in a row. And I became very fond of those places because after you'd been for the first time, you found that the second year you got there, you were already familiar with the layout of the place 
and you could focus on the people or you could focus on the specific area that you wanted to. Maybe you met up with old friends or maybe the people in the area you would visit because you'd met them before. So Mary and Joseph and Jesus get to Jerusalem and they celebrate the feast of the Passover. And for a 12 year old, it would have been an exciting time. As a 12 year old boy, Jesus would have just been making the transition from having to stay with the women and children to being allowed into the group with the older boys and the men. He would have been approaching the age at which he would go through the ceremony to become what was called a son of the covenant. Today we call it a bar mitzvah in the Jewish faith. It was a coming of age ceremony and at the 12 year old Jesus would just have been beginning to transition. Which kind of helps us to understand how it was that Mary and Joseph managed to lose him. Luke tells us every year they went to Jerusalem for the Passover. When he was 12 years old, they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware. I don't know about you, but to me that's bad parenting. I mean, I don't think it's possible that my wife and I would go away on holiday and on our way home suddenly look at the back of the car and say to each other, hang on, something's missing. Didn't we used to have a son? I think we'd be make, making sure that the first thing that we packed into the car was our son. But Mary and Joseph, you see, lived in a very different time. The women and children would not only have worshipped separately, but they also would have travelled at a different place in the caravan of travellers that was making its way back towards Galilee. And so it suddenly becomes entirely understandable how Joseph assumed that the child Jesus was with his mother and that Mary assumes that the adolescent Jesus was with his father and between them they left Jerusalem with no Jesus. Every parent's worst nightmare. And sure enough when they realise there must have been panic when they suddenly look, look around and say where's Jesus? I thought he's with you. No it's not with me, I thought it was with you. Where is he? You can almost you can almost imagine Mary saying, oh, I can't believe it, oh, he's done it again, he's always trying to be independent, isn't he? And Joseph's standing there saying, well, <laughs> you can't blame my genes, can you? There would have been panic, and eventually they, they realise that the only thing to do is to retrace their steps. They start heading back to Jerusalem, and when they get there, they enter this city not knowing where he is. They search and search and search. They would have gone back to their lodgings, maybe back to places they ate, maybe looking for, for people who they had been talking to and spending time with, maybe going back to, to places that they visited. And eventually, in the temple courtyard, they find him after three days. It's not the last time that Jesus went to Jerusalem for the Passover feast and disappeared for three days before being found. This time is slightly different to the experience at the end of the gospel though, because this time Mary and Joseph go looking not in the tombs, but in the temple. And eventually they find him. They find him sitting in the temple courts among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Jesus is already showing the inkling of what was to come. Now, some scholars argue that from the word go, Jesus would have known his purpose on earth. Others say that there was a revelation. The father revealed to the son throughout his lifetime his purpose. And it was only as he began to get to the latter stages of his ministry that he realised what the fulfilment of his time on earth was going to look like. It's possible that the adolescent Jesus, the 12 year old Jesus, knew already what was to come. But it's also entirely possible that he was just beginning to explore an inkling that God had a very, very special relationship with him and that he had a purpose greater than anybody had ever had before. We can't know, but what we do know is that as he sat among the teachers, maybe the Pharisees, maybe even 
priests. He was asking questions which demonstrated a depth of knowledge and understanding that was unprecedented. However, no matter how smart a 12-year-old looks, he's never too big for a lash of the tongue from his mother. Mary and Joseph see him and Luke says they were astonished. Well, you would be, wouldn't you? Here he is surrounded by some of the most learned men in the Jewish faith and he's asking questions which are challenging them, which are making them stop and think. But the astonishment doesn't last too long. Imagine the embarrassment at 12 years old. Your mum suddenly comes walking up to you when you've got this audience of, of, of more mature people. And she says, why have you treated us like this? I suspect there might have been even stronger words said. I suspect there might have been a clip round the ear. I suspect that Joseph might have pulled him away saying, don't you dare do that again. Do you know how worried we've been? How on earth could you treat us like this? I mean, I remember being 12 years old and playing football with mates down at the park. And one of them had said, I've got to be back at four o'clock. And four o'clock came, but the match was still going on. And he got to quarter past four, half past four, five o'clock, half past five. And in the back of your mind, you're thinking, oh, oh, you're going to be in trouble. You're going to be for it. And sometimes, in the really bad times, there would suddenly, through the corner gate of the park, be a parent appearing. And you would hear a name bellowed across the park. And suddenly the match ground to a halt and the culprit had to do the walk of shame across the park and you could hear the shouting going on right until they closed their front door behind them. I suspect Jesus probably had an earful when this happened. And yet look at his response. His response is one which in one sense we can interpret as a cocky 12 year old looking to diffuse the situation or maybe simply make his parents look a bit silly. He says, why are you searching for me? Why are you, why are you fussing? Why are you looking for me? I'm all right. I'm 12 years old. I know what I'm doing. I can look after myself because every 12 year old thinks that. Why are, you, why are you searching for me? And then he says, didn't you know? I had to be in my father's house. You see, if any other 12 year old had said this, you would think he was just being a bit cocky, a bit rude to his parents. But this is Jesus. We place a great deal of importance on what Jesus said as an adult. When we look at Jesus in, his, in the midst of his ministry from the age of around 30 to the point where he, he ascended back into heaven at the age of around 33. It was about a three year period that, he, that his ministry um, took place in. We place a great deal of importance upon every single word that we have recorded from the lips of Jesus and rightly so. But you see, wisdom can come from the lips of babes. We shouldn't disregard what the 12 year old Jesus says here. In fact, when he was lost in Jerusalem, when he was left behind in the temple, he took solace in his father's house. He says, why were you searching for me? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? I was lost, I was left behind, I was hungry. I was desperate. I had to go to my father's house. This was the place I went to for, to take refuge. This was the place I went to to be safe. I'm in my father's house. What are you doing panicking and worrying? Why are you looking around the rest of the city going mad with, with, with anxiety? I was always going to be in my father's house. It's the, nat it's the logical, natural place to be. Now, of course, Mary and Joseph didn't understand then, not because they were stupid, but because they, hadn't, they didn't have the knowledge that we have. They didn't know then what Jesus was going to go on to do. They knew that he was very special. They knew that God had a special plan for him, but they didn't know what it was. 
They didn't know what it was any more than anybody else did, and so of course they didn't understand what Jesus said. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and men. I wonder how many times over the dinner table back in Galilee, someone said, do you remember that time when, that time when we got a whole day's journey away from Jerusalem and no one realised Jesus was missing? <laughs> Can you believe it? Maybe even when news came of some of Jesus' miracles and healings, maybe they said, wow, that was the kid that we left behind. <laughs> Or maybe when he was crucified on the cross, they looked back on that hill in Jerusalem and remembered and felt a guilt or a sadness for the time that they'd left Jesus behind. Or maybe they looked at his words, they revi revisited his response to them. Why are you searching for me? Didn't you know I'd be in my father's house? You see, when Jesus comes out of the tomb at the end of, of the gospel, when, he's, when the resurrection is realised, he says to the ladies looking amongst the tombs, he says, why are you looking for the living amongst the dead? It's a very similar challenge. Why are you searching for me? But even today, even today, we can feel a sense of guilt sometimes that we've left Jesus behind. Even today, we can find ourselves in the busyness of life, the busyness of, of right, I've been to church on a Sunday, I've, I've ticked the box, I've spent the time with God, and now, look, the car park's emptying, the chicken's in the oven, we've got people coming round, we've got to go, 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 get home. We've done our bit. We've been to the feast of Pentecost. We've been to the Sunday morning service. Let's get home. The busyness. Look, everyone's going. We've got to go, go, go. Get back on it. Get back out there into life. I wonder if sometimes it wouldn't hurt for us to have the same heart as the child Jesus. Looking and thinking, I'm not ready yet to get back on it, to go, go, go. I want to stay a bit longer in my father's presence. I want to come to know him more. I want to spend more time dwelling in the, in the spirit of God, in the presence of God. I want to explore with him. I don't just want to come along as a one-off and then disappear off again into a busy week until I come back again next week because that's my habit, that's my routine. Instead, I want to stop. I want to reflect. It's really been on my heart recently that in the past couple of years, a staggering number of mainly young men that I know in the sort of 30 to 50 bracket have suddenly found that they've left Jesus behind to such an extent, or maybe they even, never even knew him, that the busyness of life, the need to be on that journey, the need to be at the front of the travelling caravan, constantly trying to keep up, has just left them empty. It's just left them absolutely exhausted. In the Christian walk, it's so easy to get caught up in that. I've been asked before, what's your favourite Bible verse? And to be honest, I, I hate that question because I don't believe we should have favourite Bible verses. I believe that we should value all scripture equally, but, but, if I'm pushed on it, I'll say Ephesians 6, 7. Serve wholeheartedly as if you're serving God, not man. It's a great verse. It's a verse that has gone through my mind so many times when I've been in ministry and even before that. Serving, wanting to serve as if I'm serving God, not man. But you know what that verse says? It says it's all about me. Do, do, do. I want to serve as if I'm serving God, not man. It's about me. And it makes me reflect. If I keep that as my mantra, if I keep going and going and going, because of course if I'm, if I'm serving God then I'm, I'm never going to want to stop. I never want to stop serving God. I want to be going and going and going. But that's only going to lead to one place and that place 
that place is emptiness. You end up giving and giving and giving until you've got nothing more to give. We have to make time to say, if they're going, let them go. If life is carrying on, let it carry on. I'm going to dwell in the presence of my father. I'm going to stay behind and learn in my father's house. So of course, today is Father's Day. And Father's Day is always a, a difficult subject to mention in a sermon because for some people it's a day of real joy and for some people it's just not. For instance, by the time that you watch this, I'm quite sure that I would have been woken up with a large bacon sandwich with lashings of brown sauce and a pot of fresh coffee. I would then have been um, presented with various different gifts from my, from my wife and son. And then of course I'll be um, about to enjoy an afternoon lazing in the sunshine or maybe laying on the sofa watching sport on TV all afternoon because they're good like that. I hope. But you see for some people Father's Day is irrelevant because they're not a father and their own father isn't around anymore. For some people it's quite painful because it brings back memories of, of someone that they loved but have lost. For some people, actually, they didn't have a positive father figure in their life. And so to talk about Father's Day is a very awkward subject. For some people, they will spend Father's Day wishing that they'd known a father at all. I acknowledge that. And so I'm not gonna celebrate, I'm not gonna do a sermon celebrating Father's Day. But I am gonna say, Make sure that today, this Father's Day, however you may feel about the earthly father that you have, make sure that you acknowledge and spend time in the presence of your heavenly father. You see, if we take God out of Christmas, then Christmas becomes an empty, meaningless occasion, which has no relevance once the food's been eaten and the presents have been unwrapped. Or if we take God out of Easter, it's just a bank holiday with some chocolate eggs and then you move on and there's nothing happens. There's no relevance to it. In the same way, I believe that God is in Father's Day. I believe that God is in every single day. God wants us to make every single day a, a, a day in which we acknowledge and dwell in the presence of our Heavenly Father. And that is so important, especially during this lockdown period. So many of you I've spoken to over the past few weeks and I've heard stories of, of people working so hard during lockdown. For many people the, uh, the normal routine has been lost. There's no longer the opportunity to wake up in the morning and, and maybe, maybe have a little bit of time relaxing on the train on the way to work or take that walk through the park as you're heading up to the office or whatever it might be the normal routine that you've over years learnt to to find some time to spend on your own with God that's been lost and so now you find that you wake up at say six o'clock in the morning and by quarter past six you've turned on your laptop and because you're only dealing with emails you're not sitting in an office you haven't even bothered yet to have a shower and you then sit there until you suddenly feel hungry mid-morning and have something to eat but you feel a bit guilty that you're away from your screen and you you go back and maybe at some point you might grab time to have a, a, a shower or a shave and, and get properly dressed if you've got a zoom call you might stick something smart on but most of the time you might not need to and then you suddenly realize it's nine o'clock at night or ten o'clock or 11 o'clock and you think I must get to bed but there's still a sense of guilt as you close the laptop screen and you realise that once again you've done a, a 15, 16, 17 hour day and the only time that you're not a slave to your laptop is when you're going to sleep. That's not healthy. That's, that's not a good way of living life. And today I urge you to spend time spend time with anyone whether you've got children whether you've got parents whether you've you're with friends or family dwell in their presence enjoy their company 
We've lost the ability to socialise for so long that it's important that we, that we stick within the guidelines that we've got to stick to, but also that we take, we take the opportunity now. We make the most of being able to meet up with people, to spend time in one another's company. But it's also important on Father's Day that we follow the example of Jesus, that we don't get caught up in the rush, that we don't tick the box of having done church, watched a sermon, and then switch it off and go back into the busyness. It's important that at some point today, we commit to sitting and spending time in the presence of God, that we dwell in the presence of our Father. It's what Jesus did in the temple. He didn't allow himself to be whisked away with the caravan of travellers back towards Galilee to get on with life. Instead, he took the opportunity to stay in his father's house, to deepen his knowledge, to deepen his understanding, to deepen his relationship with God the Father. When we, when we look at Psalm 23, we read these words. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He restores my soul. That's why we spend time in the presence of God. That's why it's so important that in, in, this, in this time of lockdown where life is so busy because we're working from home and we're homeschooling and, and there's Zoom calls and everything we do seems to revolve around, around a laptop or a tablet or something like that and there's no opportunity to get out and just take ourselves away and relax. It's so important that we spend time with the one who can restore our soul. Psalm 62 begins with these words. My soul finds rest in God alone. My soul finds rest in God alone. It doesn't find rest in the latest Netflix series. It doesn't find rest in that tub of Ben and Jerry's. It doesn't find rest in, in a Zoom quiz or, um, or going and sitting in someone's garden. It finds rest in God alone. There's nothing wrong with doing all those things, but don't let them take place at the expense of spending time with God. He's our heavenly father. And on this Father's Day, if nothing else, then I urge you to commit to spending time with him and commit to making it a daily discipline to spend time dwelling, resting, being restored in his presence. The 12 year old Jesus set us an example which we must not ignore because he knew what was good for us. Let's pray. God, we thank you. You're such a good father. You're such a good dad. We thank you we can lay our burdens at your feet. Thank you that we are known by you. And we praise you for the way that you love and discipline us. We choose to trust in you. Thank you for those who have been father to us in our lives please bless them and Holy Spirit I just ask that as we open our hearts to you you would fill us up and you would send us out in the power of Jesus name Amen <laughs>